one microphone? Oh, it's up here. Okay. All right, we have a, uh, another uh, external guest here for our Kent seminar. Um, Dr. Jake Hiller is an associate professor at Michigan Technology University, Michigan Tech for short. Yeah, it's something. Um, Easier to say. At least we have at least one graduate from there in this room. You'll have to pick out who it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, if there's another one, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, Jake, um, uh, <coughs> Professor Hiller, sorry. You can call me Jake, that's all right. He worked for me for that's a couple right. of years. Many, many years. Uh, many years. Um, and enjoyed it, I think. I survived. He's uh, got his bachelor's from uh, Michigan State and then uh, his master's in Michigan State working on roller compacted concrete with uh, Niraj Booch over there. Went to, uh, briefly went to Minnesota. His advisor uh, left and then I had an opportunity to, to hire him as a grad student back in there in 2001. And he then finished a PhD here at Illinois and went directly to Michigan Tech as a assistant professor. Uh, he's involved in concrete material, concrete pavement work, and today he's going to talk about um, moisture warping and uh, jointed plane concrete pavement. So let's welcome Jake. Thank you. Well, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to kind of come down here. Um, it's been, I think, I came down here this summer. It was the first time in eight years I was down here, and so we got a chance to kind of catch up and see some things, and it's nice to kind of come down and, and, and see a few things again. Uh, so I get... I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and, and talk with you guys. Uh, before we get started, uh, as always, one of the key things I learned as a PhD student, you remember this, Jeff, about acknowledgments. We, did, we didn't give an acknowledgment to a paper one time, so I always make sure that we have an acknowledgment section. When you write a paper, uh, when you do a presentation, you need to make the acknowledgments in terms of who funded and who helped out. So um, this is a little side project that we did, um, but originally the project was funded by Michigan Department of Transportation, a little bit of a side project with, with Minnesota Department of Transportation. Um, there's Michigan Tech funds here. And then a few students worked on this. Um, Dr. Rita Lutterly, uh, she ended up doing her PhD at the University of Minnesota, but she did her master's with us. A lot of her work is going to be here. Undergraduate Morgan Hansen, Corey Shorkey was a master's student of mine who did a lot of work uh, in the laboratory. And then a postdoc, uh, Dr. Eugenie uh, Desponde, she also helped out uh, a bit with some of this stuff. So just quickly here, uh, giving my little brief uh, overview. Again, as uh, Dr. Razor said here, I went by BS and MS in Michigan State. Uh, PhD at the University of Illinois here, uh, finished up in 2007. Um, you know, it was, I was, as we were alluding to last night, it was actually a really interesting time to be at the University of Illinois at that time because you end up having a lot of the younger faculty uh, who are now the older faculty, Professor Razor, Professor Tatumler, Professor Butler. Uh, you know, they were kind of newer faculty kind of coming into to the department here, uh, but we still had a lot of the old guard. We still had a lot of the you know, Ernie Berenbergs and Marshall Thompsons and, and, and those people there. So it was a real interesting time uh, to be at the University of Illinois. And, uh, for those like myself that, that kind of came to the program at that time, uh, I think we were, were really uh, was beneficial to us in many ways. Uh, the, 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 one of the things I think that you know, I've talked with my colleagues over the years is, is the mentoring that we got from all those faculty members, uh, both their own advisors as well as the group itself was uh, tremendous in all of our careers. So we definitely appreciate that. And I spent the last almost nine years here at Michigan Tech. Um, so first question people say Michigan Tech is where is Michigan Tech? Um, only one of you should know where Michigan Tech is. You can you hopefully can find it here. I'm going to pull up a little map here of the uh, U.S. interstate system. And what the first thing you'll notice about Michigan Tech is it's nowhere near any of the interstates and the interstate system. Okay, you can kind of see all these little highways kind of coming up here, and as they start to get towards Houghton, they just kind of quit. They're like this is uh, there's not there's nothing worthy of uh, of continuing the highway to kind of get up here. So um, it's about about four hours to the nearest interstate uh, from Houghton. You're taking a lot of back roads and stuff. It's a uh, uh, I've learned to like it, but it's it, it's definitely up there. Um, this is sort of a, a famous picture that was put up by some students here in the late 70s. Uh, they they constructed their own little sign here and put this up uh, coming into the US 41 in Houghton here. Uh, end of the earth, uh, two miles, Houghton, four. So uh, it's kind of a famous picture here of Michigan Tech. So a little bit about Michigan Tech here. Um, again, it's in Houghton, Michigan, uh, up on uh, Lake Superior. Uh, beautiful area when it's not snowing. Um, about 7,000 students, uh, so a little bit smaller here than the than, uh, than University of Illinois. Over about two-thirds of those are engineers, so it's a primarily an engineering school. Um, we average about 200 inches of snow. Um, I know it's hard to fathom what 200 inches of snow is. Um, here's a picture of my kids. This is three years ago. 
Uh, this is the first day of spring. I kid you not. Uh, this is the side of my driveway here. This is about eight and a half, nine feet of snow um, from here, and this is the bottom of the driveway. That's the first day of spring. That's March 21st, 2013. Not all winters are that bad. Uh, that one was particularly bad. Um, there's a lot of snow, uh, so you kind of have to learn to kind of enjoy it. Um, we have a thing called Winter Carnival, uh, which happens every February. Um, a lot of ice sculptures. Here's one. It's hard to see. It's hard. It's much more. It's much better to kind of see it up, per, up, uh, person close and all, or up, up close and personal. Excuse me. Uh, this is basically a, a sculpture of a uh, city of New York. Here's the uh, you know Statue of Liberty, Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, the details of these are month-long competitions to kind of put this together. Uh, they really kind of get out and enjoy the winter. Um, if you don't, you kind of go mad pretty quickly. So. Um, during the summer, when the students are all leave, that's the best part about Michigan Tech. Uh, it's actually a beautiful area. A typical summer day is about 72 and sunny with light breeze coming off the lake. Um, it is a nice place to, to live in that respect. So uh, there's a picture I took uh, kayaking here on the Portage Canal. Here's the campus uh, right here, sort of downtown. Here's what we call our Portage Lift Bridge, uh, kind of our, our famous bridge that uh, kind of lifts up uh, when, when big ships come through the canal here. So anyways, a little bit about Michigan Tech. So. What I'm here today to talk a little bit today is about uh, this research project we dealt talking about uh, differential drying shrinkage and warping and, and how it sort of affects concrete pavements. Um, we start looking at where sources of moisture come in pavements. There's a lot of different ways moisture can kind of get into the pavement system. You know, we kind of, you know, seepage, capillary action from the water table, coming through the edge, coming down from high ground. Uh, unfortunately, through surface discontinuities, uh, fortunately, uh, we don't do things perfectly, so we do get some discontinuities and cracks and whatnot in our pavements, but water can get in a lot of different ways. Um, when you think about concrete, though, uh, you kind of think of concrete as almost like a, a relatively impervious, impervious uh, material, okay? The water will pond on concrete. Um, it's, it does have some porosity, but again, it's really not, uh, it, it's very difficult for, for water to sort of percolate through it. It will eventually, but it's going to kind of take some time. When we start looking at concrete uh, at different scales here, we do have pores that we're dealing with here. You know, looking at scales here, we're going to have some trapped air pores. We have entrained air pores. You know, we're kind of coming down here to sort of the, you know, this maybe 100 microns is about maybe the, the width of a human hair. We start looking at some of the hydration products here. Um, but we have a lot of capillary voids, uh, particularly when high water cement ratio um, mixes. We're going to get a lot of voids from this. We do get uh, gel pores. We start looking at that at the nano levels. Uh, difficult to kind of see, but the fact is when you're looking at millions or billions or trillions of these pores, they start to add up. Okay, and this is a huge portion of, of concrete. Um, and it does have some, some detrimental effects in what we deal with. Um, and one of those detrimental effects is shrinkage. Um, shrinkage is just sort of a, something that happens with the concrete. When those pores start to empty, okay, whether they be capillary pores, whether they be gel pores, a little more difficult, um, we start to get this, this basically water leaving the system. Okay? And the water's leaving the system. We end up getting sort of this curved menisci here. We can kind of go back and look at sort of the capillary tension we're going to get here. We start to get this vacuum kind of pulling on those pores. And again, we start talking about millions or billions or maybe trillions of these pores emptying, it's going to kind of shrink. Okay? It's the same thing we start looking at uh, your skin in the winter. Okay? Your skin gets a little dry. Okay? We start basically seeing the, the water sort of leaving your system, sort of drying, start to shrink a little bit. The same thing's happening with concrete. And you know, when it's a, when it's a, um, depending on the level, it can cause some, some serious problems uh, that we really haven't addressed very well in concrete pavements over the years. So. So again, moisture can kind of get in and out of these pores a little bit, um, and really sort of based on the sort of the simplicity of our pavement geometry. Uh, you know, it's amazing to me to think we've had 2,000 plus years of pavements, and we're still stuck with a rectangular block. That's the best we've kind of come up with. But sort of the simple geometry is is, is good and bad. Um, it, it's it makes things uh, simple in some ways and very difficult in other ways. We have this basically simple geometry where at the surface we're starting to get a lot of things happening. We can get you know rain events, so water's getting into there. We might have low ambient relative humidity, so it's going to be drying from the surface. We have loads coming to the surface. There's a lot of things happening to that surface. Um, and so what we end up having is sort of maybe the top, I'll say 50 to maybe 150 millimeters, two to one to three inches. We're going to start to get a lot of moisture movement in that area of the concrete. Okay. How about below that concrete? Maybe below two or three inches. What's our concrete going to, going to be like in terms of moisture? You know, it's, it's pretty consistent, right? It's really not changing a lot. Those top couple inches, though, a lot of things are happening based on what's happening uh, in the ambient environment here. So what that ends up leading to, though, is a very nonlinear moisture gradient through our concrete. Okay? And that causes a bit of problems when we start dealing with uh, uh, design and analysis of concrete. 
So when we start looking at moisture loss, there's a couple different ways, of course. We can lose moisture through drying, uh, but we also lose moisture through autogenous shrinkage or self desiccation okay? This is basically just the, the hydration process happening, consuming that water and causing some shrinkage. What's the difference between autogenous shrinkage and drying shrinkage, though? You want to volunteer this? Yeah. Well, both of them are, are going to lose water. Okay. One's basically kind of absorbing through sort of the hydration process. It's sort of self-consuming or self-desiccating. Okay. That's autogenous shrinkage. So what's one of the biggest differences in terms of where this is happening? Where's autogenous shrinkage going to happen in the concrete? Internal. Internal. The whole thing. Okay. The whole thing's going to go through the autogenous shrinkage. You're basically going to get a relatively uniform shrinkage throughout the entire slab. Okay. Whereas drying shrinkage is really going to happen only in the top surface. Okay, so we start talking about the nonlinearity. It's really because of drying shrinkage and not necessarily because of autogenous shrinkage. Okay. And we can control both of these through, through mechanisms here. We can control autogenous shrinkage by having a little bit higher water cement ratio. That being said, the higher water cement ratios tend to lead to more, more drying shrinkage, okay, more capillary pores. So that becomes a bit of a, a balance that we kind of have to go through here. We talk about moisture uh, loss in concrete uh, two different ways. We call it something called drying shrinkage or something called warping. Okay. And really, this is basically the same mechanism. It's basically losing water uh, through drying. Um, again, tied to gel pores, tied to smaller capillary pores. Um, way I look at this here, I like to call differential drying shrinkage permanent shrinkage, shrinkage that when it happens, it's not coming back. And I like to think of warping as something that if you re-wet that concrete, it will sort of flatten out. Okay, but it's really the same mechanism that we're sort of seeing here. We start looking at volume changes in concrete here. Uh, this starts to affect our concrete in terms of the stresses that are built up from this. We typically look at the moisture, um, when we look at analysis, we look at it from an, an equivalent temperature difference. What temperature difference across the slab from maybe the top to the bottom would it take to give us that same shape of the slab? Uh, it's just computationally a little bit easier to kind of handle that way. So we can basically get sort of a, a typical curved up shape, which you see a lot for drying. You have a curled down shape, which you see from a, a what we call positive temperature gradient where it might be hotter in the top than the bottom. But basically these the deformations either cause from moisture or from temperature and the stresses are going to be caused from that self-weight, basically the restraint that's causing that self-weight, kind of uh, pulling that slab down, trying to get back to a flat slab condition. We start looking at the different things that cause volumetric uh, changes here. I kind of put these in five different categories here. Um, we could have curling from temperature gradients. We have warping and differential drying shrinkage. Again, same mechanism. We're losing water generally from the top of the slab here. We have something called construction curls. Anyone heard of construction curl before? Construction curl is kind of a, a um, I don't want to say controversial, but uh, it, it's it's still sort of being debated. When we place the concrete slab, when it's going through initial hydration, that initial and final set, there's probably going to be a temperature gradient through that when it's set there. And so the original thought was to kind of get that same flat slab when it's kind of being set, you need that same temperature gradient to kind of go through that. And there's some evidence that says that that does happen. There's some evidence that says it doesn't happen. There's also some evidence that says this original construction, construction curl really kind of goes through a, a creep. The creep of concrete at the initial, at the early ages is actually pretty high. There's a high ability to creep or sort of relax those stresses, relax those uh, those strains. And so maybe a lot of that construction curl might sort of get taken up from that, but these are sort of five different components that can kind of cause our slabs to do, um, to go through some sort of volumetric strain changes. So why does this matter? Okay. For our slabs curling up or down, you know, it's gonna happen. Um, what that happens though, is if it curls up enough, if we basically start to get some some gaps here underneath the slab with the underlying layers, we start to get some gaps. Okay. And then either from just the self-weight of the slab itself, maybe being high enough to generate enough stresses to crack it, it could crack. Or typically what ends up happening is we're gonna have some vehicular loads, some external loads, gonna add to that and cause some, some premature cracking or cracking we didn't necessarily expect. So that becomes a bit of a problem. The key thing here is when we start to get these, this warping or temperature gradients curling, is you start to change that boundary condition. We go back and think about our, our Westergaard edge stresses. I'm sure you all want to refresh our Westergaard edge stresses here. But one of the key things that we assume there is we had full support. Okay, we had a load, a single load at the edge of a slab that was fully supported. Okay, and the fact is when we start to have this curling and warping, that's not quite going to be the same. It's not quite going to be that way. So in that case, it might change our primary fill mechanism, or it might cause premature fatigue failure if this isn't addressed in design, which in the past it really hasn't been. So we start looking at slab deformation here. Here's our good buddy Juan Pablo Corrubias here. This is an old picture, I like to recycle this one here. Uh, looking at basically a, a, a built-in curl, a curl of the slab is sort of happening. You see he has sort of a string line here. You kind of see the shadow, it might be hard, difficult to see from the, from the back there. 
we're basically seeing a gap, a pretty large gap. Uh, and this is a case where you start to see a lot of probably differential drying shrinkage in a very dry area, very dry climate, causing the slab to kind of curl up like this. Okay. Um, and again, if it's something that we don't necessarily take in consideration that that's going to happen, we might have unsupported corners. Um, we're going to have premature failures. We're going to have failures that uh, we didn't necessarily uh, design for. So let's talk a little bit about how the mechanistic empirical pavement design guide, or pavement memory design, wherever they want to call it this month, um, how they sort of deal with temperature and how they deal with moisture. So what they're going to do here is they're going to break it up into sort of really two different components. The equivalent temperature gradient, which is really made up of a temperature gradient, an actual predicted temperature gradient, temperature from the top minus the temperature at the bottom, as well as a moisture gradient. Uh, there's some serious issues with the moisture, there's some issues with both of these in my opinion, but uh, there are some issues with the moisture gradient, which I'll talk about here a little bit later. And then we have something I like to call built-in curl, okay? And this built-in curl is really made up of three components here. The construction curl, this permanent differential drying shrinkage, the drying that's happened that can't be reversible, um, as well as maybe some creep components that sort of counteract this in some way. Um, there's a number that they put into the, the uh, design guide for the built-in curl. Is anyone familiar with this, this input into the MEPDG? Does anyone know what the default value for that value? What, what percent, what, what degree Fahrenheit temperature difference, equivalent temperature difference we now use for built-in curl? Is anyone familiar with that number? Well, basically, in the design guide, they basically say this is going to be negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit built-in curl. There's an equivalent curl from these factors that they've said in the design guide is going to sort of have, we're going to kind of not start from a flat slab. We're going to start from this negative 10 degree curled up position, uh, sort of the default. And one of the big issues with the MEPDG is you can change that value. Uh, but when you change that value, a bunch of bells and whistles kind of pop up and say, don't change this number unless you really, really know what you're doing. Okay. Um, most people don't know what they're doing, um, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that value here. But we'll sort of add these, these equivalent temperature gradients from, from temperature or moisture, this built-in curl, and we'll get sort of a total equivalent temperature difference, and that's what we're going to analyze. This is something that's going to change over time as temperature changes, as moisture changes. Why this becomes a little bit important, though, is if we have enough built-in curl, uh, this is looking at a frequency distribution of temperature difference for a particular site, uh, this is a three-dimensional one looking at sort of the nonlinearity or self-equilibrating stresses here, uh, something that we did here back at the University of Illinois when I was here. If you have no built-in curl, you can kind of see we have some cases where we have a negative temperature difference. We have some cases where we have a positive temperature difference. So the slab's going to be sometimes curled down when we have a positive temperature difference. It's going to be curled up when we have a negative temperature difference. And that's going to kind of be too expected. But the fact is if we have enough built-in curl, the built-in curl is, is large enough, it's basically going to take this distribution and it's going to shift it in one direction, to the negative direction here. In this case, we have a negative 18 degrees Celsius built-in curl. It's shifting this entire distribution to our right um, to the point where you can see, if we look at the zero degrees of positive numbers here, we have nothing. We never, ever have a slab that's curled down like this, okay, if that built-in curl is large enough. So this becomes a bit of an issue. I want to talk a little bit now about reversible shrinkage. Um, so a uh, little interesting story about reversal shrinkage. This was, was taken uh, from the MEPDG design guide here. Um, what we're going to assume is that we're going to have some drying of our concrete is going to happen. And we're going to say some of, that re some of that is reversible, meaning if we kind of take this, we'll actually plot it this way, because mostly uh, you see these curves kind of plot this way, where if basically our concrete is drying, we're going to sort of increase our strain levels as it's drying. Okay? But if we re-wet it, we can actually sort of reverse some of that. But we can't really reverse all of that. So if we kind of look at this here, again, we go through a drying period of our concrete sort of hydrating. We're getting a lot of shrinkage that's sort of happening. If we re wet that concrete, we can reverse some of that. But you can see some of this is permanent. Some of that's not coming back. Okay. This was basically developed uh, for the MEPDG. And they assumed that half the drying shrinkage in our concrete MEPDG is reversible and half is irreversible. Okay. Now, where did they get that number? This is a quote, I won't name who told me this quote. They came in here and said, well, if you do this, you put two fingers here, and then you put two fingers here, uh, it's about 50, about, about half and half. So that's the number they use for 50%. That's where that number came from, okay? There's no rational basis for it besides that we see this in the textbooks a lot. We know what happens. Um, we should address it in some way. So we went and we kind of looked back um, 
this is a, a Rita Letterly when she was a master student of mine. We kind of went back and we tried to look for a lot of historical uh, references on, on reversible shrinkage. And we didn't really find a lot. Um, what we did find quite a bit was from a gentleman at Le Hermite, um, who actually Rylam has a, a medal for young researchers named after him. Uh, did some in the late 40s and early 50s, he did a lot of work on, on reversible shrinkage. And he's basically saying here, again, depending on how you're curing things, how what, what sort of curing conditions are initially, it changed the amount of reversible shrinkage. And in some cases, you know, 40 to 70% of that shrinkage might be reversible. Okay. But it was really dependent a lot on how you cured that concrete. What was interesting about this was this is all in French, which is just French to me. Uh, luckily, the student was actually working on it, uh, grew up speaking French, so she was actually quite advantageous that she kind of worked on this project. So she found a lot of information for us uh, based on this, but there wasn't a lot of information about this. There wasn't a lot of things that kind of went on with this. Um, we start looking back into why this is happening. Uh, this mechanism is not well understood. Okay. We know what happens. We can, we can visually test it. We can see it happening. Why it's happening is still debatable. So uh, Adam Neville in his textbook here looked at saying, you know, these, these uh, calcium silica hydrate gels are forming. Uh, they kind of create some bonds here during the drying phase. Uh, when it's exposed to moisture, the bonds kind of swell, but they kind of hold tight. So basically saying some of this is going to be reversible, some of it's not based on these bonds, based on these Van der Waal forces for the CSH gels. That's just his hypothesis, though. There wasn't really a, sort of a uh, research study done to kind of assess why this was happening. Some more recent work here, again in France, was kind of looking at maybe as far as this, why some is reversible and some is not, is based on microcracking. You get some microcracks that are going to kind of form when this drying is happening. Those are irreversible. Those aren't going to come back together again. So again, there's, there's still some debate and looking at why this is happening. The fact is we can observe it happening, but the why is still something that's uh, sort of left uh, unsaid. So what I'm going to talk about next here is a little bit looking at uh, a research project that we did. It was originally funded by the Michigan Department of Transportation, um, and we were looking at recycled concrete as, as coarse aggregates in new concrete. Okay. So we had a bunch of different sources of, 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 of aggregates. Uh, we went and this basically did some plain J mixes, 0.42 water cement ratio, no supplementary some materials, you know, about uh, a five and a half sack uh, mix here, high amount of coarse aggregates in terms of the, the volume. So kind of a paving mix that we would typically pave with a slip form paver, uh, trying to reduce the amount of shrinkage we're going to see here. Uh, you know, typical air entrainment, typical slumps we're kind of looking at here. But just kind of looking at characterization of materials with recycled concrete. And one of the things, we did a lot of things. We did restrained shrinkage, we did strength, we did fracture, we did a lot of different properties. But one of the things we focused on was looking at um, shrinkage. Okay. So basically we had these, these length change tests, basically looking at prisms of concrete, both sealed and unsealed. Okay, so we basically have some of these are sealed with, with aluminum tape here, some are unsealed. Why are we, why are we sealing some of these? What would, what would doing that help us with? Yeah, we're basically with the, with the aluminum tape here, we're trying to kind of keep the moisture not getting out, but not getting in. They were trying to assess the autogenous shrinkage only. Okay. Whereas the unsealed systems are looking at both autogenous shrinkage as well as undergoing drying shrinkage. And so we kind of look at, to find the drying shrinkage, we kind of take the difference between those two to find what the drying shrinkage is here. So again, we look at a bunch of different coarse aggregates here, virgin gravel, recycled concrete uh, that was blast furnace slag, recycled concrete that was limestone, recycled concrete that was gravel. Uh, we have twice recycled, or what we called a 3G aggregate. This was a, an aggregate that was in use in the field for 20 years. They recycled it, put in the new concrete for 20 more years, and now we're basically using it sort of a third generation of use uh, in this laboratory study. Uh, we did a little bit of a lightweight virgin blend here, 3% uh, coarse aggregate blend here. Um, and with these specimens, again, we, basically, we start them at constant relative humidity, either 50% relative humidity or 100% relative humidity for a year. Okay, we pulled samples out, test them, put them back, look at how this length change is happening. And again, what we're trying to assess here is the, the shrinkage that's happening of these concretes. So if we sort of look at this here, uh, a lot of data is just kind of looking at this. But this is looking at the unsealed systems, it basically fog cured over one year. Actually, this only shows 100, 100 days of data here. but. Um, and what we saw here is that the crushed gravel, the, the virgin aggregate, um, had not a lot of growth, okay? Whereas the, um, the recycled concrete aggregates, because they have much more porosity in the aggregates themselves, there's hydrated, there, there's hydrated, unhydrated mortar, there's capillary pores in the aggregates themselves, um, you saw a much higher growth of uh, when it was exposed to moisture over time. If you take these and look at the drying shrinkage um, in the 50% relative humidity cure, we kind of see the same thing where the crushed gravel, it, there was shrinkage that was going on, there was drying shrinkage that happened, but it was much less 
than the recycled concrete aggregates. So that was one of the conclusions we kind of came with here. There's more we could kind of talk about, but that's a whole other lecture we don't really have time for. What we decided to do though, is we said, you know, after a year, we did this study. And just like most people, you, you do a study, you've got a lot, of, a lot of concrete sitting around, you know, what do you do with this? Do you just throw it away? Or, or there's something we can do with this. And we've been kind of looking at recycled uh, concrete, looking at reversible shrink and saying, you know, there's something about this. There's something in the MEPG, MEPG, eh, MEPDG about this, but yet we really didn't understand why things kind of fit together, why it was this way. And talking with some of the developers of the MEPDG, we kind of figured out that maybe we can kind of take some of this material and kind of reuse it for a little, a little side study. So again, we had some samples that were cured for 100% relative humidity and it kind of fog here for a year. And we had other samples that were cured uh, in a very low relative humidity environment for 50% for a year. Okay. Well, we said, what happens if we take these and we start switching them? Okay. We take the stuff that was in the dry conditions, put it in the wet conditions, take ones in the wet conditions, put in the dry conditions, and start to look at how much of the shrinkage is going to come back. Okay. <laughs> so this is just a, a typical sample here. Again, for a year, is in the dry conditions. We're kind of looking, sort of plotting, sort of how the, the, the shrinkage strain is kind of growing here, drying shrink. Put it in wet conditions, you can see immediately it starts to swell back up. And over time, it starts to swell back up, not complete to the, to the uh, um, original shape here, but again, put through dry conditions, it'll start to, to shrink again. It'll start to swell and kind of go back and forth here. And that's what's going to happen in pavement situ situations here. When we create a pavement in the in natural field, it's going to go through drying spells, it's going to go through wet spells. We kind of have to understand sort of how it's going to impact our, our payment solutions here. So we had to kind of look and sort of define a couple of variables here in terms of what was re what was reversible, what was permanent. Uh, we went back and looked at Lerner Meet's uh, uh, definitions here, kind of came up with sort of uh, different characteristics of, of what's reversible, what's uh, for the dry cure conditions versus the wet cure conditions, so on and so forth. And what we came up with, I'm going to skip ahead here for lack of time, to this slide. Okay. What I want to focus on here is what percent of that shrinkage was found to be reversible based on aggregate type. So these three plots here are original, what we call the dry cure. Those are basically the ones that are sitting in 50% relative humidity for one year. That's how they were cured. Basically, it's, it's like seeing a poor curing environment. Okay. You can basically see the amount of reversible for the first cycle was pretty high. Okay. Basically saying, when you first basically re-wet it, a lot of that shrinkage kind of came back. When we start looking at subsequent drying cycles after we re-wet re it, this kind of went, we actually ended up doing four or five cycles of this. We were seeing, even didn't really depend what the aggregate type was, what the mix was, what was happening. We were seeing about 30% of that shrinkage came back long-term. Okay. So originally, again, the first cycle, we see a lot come back, but the subsequent cycles that you would, of course, see in reality, multiple you know, drying and, and wetting cycles you know, for 20, 30 years for real payment, we were seeing about 30% of that shrinkage kind of come back and 70% being permanent. These two ones are looking at what we call the wet cure. These are the cycles, these are the, um, the samples that were wet cured for one year, which again, is pretty extreme. No one's gonna be curing the concrete for one year. But if you look at this again, the first cycle here, look at 80, maybe 9% is gonna be reversible. The second, and I don't have the third and fourth cycles, but we're probably looking at usually above 50, maybe even up to 80% of that's gonna be reversible, just based on how it was cured initially. So again, sort of a dry cure or a poor curing condition, we're seeing much of that the string is being permanent, okay? When we do a really good job curing, okay, when the water is available for hydration, changing the basically the hydration products we're gonna see, you can see much more that concrete shrinkage actually is reversible. And that has some pretty big impacts in terms of how we actually go about uh, uh, designing things with. So what I wanna talk about a little bit next here is the, the shrinkage of warping model that is currently in the MEPDG. Um, this was developed, uh, sort of a modified model from uh, Eisman and Lekhoff, a paper, a 1990 paper that uh, uh, one of those theoretical workshops that they had over in Europe here, uh, where basically Eisman and Lekhoff created a, a shrinkage zone. And they actually created a rectangular shrinkage zone saying, we know that shrinkage is gonna happen through the whole concrete, but it's gonna happen over a portion of it. And basically, so because this is not symmetric, it's gonna create a bending moment to our concrete that's gonna add to the stresses here. Well, the MEPDG developers decided to make a, a slight change here. They said, well, you know, having a rectangular shrinkage zone, we know that's not true. Okay. We're going to make this triangular instead of a rectangle and make it a little bit more realistic. So they kind of, they took this, uh, they said, well, maybe about two or three inches of our concrete would be our, our shrinkage zone here. And they kind of changed the model to, to accommodate a few different things here. We have the amount that's reversible. We have the ultimate shrinkage for our concrete. These are going to be some, rel these ambient relative humidity factors. So again, if you're in a very dry climate versus a very wet climate, 
It's going to impact the amount of shrinkage you're going to see. And they're going to come up with this, what we call equivalent temperature difference from humidity, okay, from shrinkage, from warping. Okay? And this is their model. It's a pretty simplistic model. Um, we decided to um, address a few different things that we saw sort of as, as problems with this. Um, let me go back here real quick. One of the problems with this model was that basically it took the, the relative humidity at any given month and compared to the average relative humidity for that site. So that basically half the time due to warping, your slab would be curled up and half the year because of warping, your, your slab would be curled down. In reality, your, your slab is never ever gonna be curled down from warping. It's either gonna be flat because there's no, there's no moisture gradient or it's gonna be curled up. Okay, so this was a sort of big issue um, that kind of came from this. We decided to kind of do, uh, we wanted, we put some limitations in terms of trying to develop to sort of better this MEPG model. And one of the key things is that we didn't want to have any additional information that had to be input into the program. You basically kind of take this model, input it in there with the existing inputs. Um, and to do that, we basically said, we're going to have to sort of, instead of having a triangular distribution shrinkage, we're going to use an ellipse. Okay, so we basically look at an equation of ellipse, put in there, basically we have an elliptical um, shrinkage formation here. We're going to be highest at the top, so we kind of go down to zero a little bit closer here, which is not perfect, but it's a lot closer to reality than a triangular formation, and much better than a rectangular formation here. So we kind of went through here. Uh, we developed a model here based on the water cement ratio in terms of what, uh, what shrinkage was going to be autogenous versus drying shrinkage. We sort of eliminated the autogenous shrinkage because that's not affecting the, the curl that's happening from, um, from, from differential drying shrinkage here. And a few other factors, and we kind of came up with this model. We borrowed... Uh, our ME relative humidity model from the, the, the Bizant uh, B3 model here to kind of address um, these factors here and kind of came up with a, a pre simplistic model. A couple of things we tried to do here, again, we check it, the elliptical model we kind of felt was, was more reality. Um, it matched a lot of what we have a, a couple of thermal moisture model we sort of developed. And it really matched a lot of those sites from actual temperature data, predicted uh, moisture movement from there. Um, we account for drying shrinkage only, where the original MEPDG model looked at both autogenous and drying shrinkage, and accounted for both of those in the shrinkage factor, so sort of, uh, in some ways, sort of overcompensated there. Um, eliminates that curled down factor, basically relating it to the average relative humidity here. We said that really didn't make sense at all. We're either gonna, we're gonna either have a flat slab or a curled up slab from, from a moisture warping here. Um, they developed for a beam, the Eisman lykoff was a model for basically added a, we added a um, Poisson's ratio effect here for two-way slab bending here. And then we also get recommended for reversal shrinkage to be about 0.3 for what I'm gonna consider typically cured concrete. And that, you know, um, was based on both ladder meets as well as some of the work that we did. So one of the things that we did from this is we said, well, we need to get some idea based on your location, based on the, the, the annual relative, the ambient relative humidity we're gonna see in different locations, we're gonna expect a different amount of differential drying shrinkage based on the location. Some locations are going to be dry, some are going to be wet. So based on our model here, this is where our concrete is three inches or 10 inches thick. Our shrinkage zone was three inches for this case, water cement ratio 0.4, mount reversal shrinkage 0.3, uh, our ultimate shrinkage being 600, which would be for a typical uh, concrete pavement uh, mix here. We kind of came up with this, this uh, design guide. So based on your location, you kind of get some idea maybe what you should sort of expect as your differential drying shrinkage, okay? In this case here for these, these particular um, uh, properties, you're kind of seeing based in the United States anywhere from a negative seven degree Fahrenheit to a negative 14 degree Fahrenheit differential drying shrinkage, equivalent temperature difference that's caused from differential drying shrinkage. So you can kind of see here in the east, eastern part of the United States, there's not much happening. The western United States, there's a lot of things happening. What's the difference between the eastern and, and the western United States in terms of humidity? West is dry, okay. Same thing if we got to look at sort of a, a very high shrinkage case here. We developed, I don't know how many, 20 or 30 of these different uh, models based on the inputs here. But based on your location, it's going to give you some indication of, based on our model, how much difference of drying shrinkage you expect to happen. Okay, And this is basically one of the inputs that kind of go into that built-in curl uh, calculation here. So we start looking at the western United States here. Uh, this is a little story that uh, John Harvey likes to talk about, uh, Professor UC Davis here. Um, but... Uh, Back in 1879, uh, there, was, there was a couple of exhibitions set out by um, a geologist named John Wesley Powell. Uh, he actually was a geologist. He taught at the uh, now Illinois Wesleyan over in uh, Bloomington there. Uh, but he was a, the head of the US Geological Survey uh, for many years after this. He's a, a 
Civil War veteran. He lost his arm in the Civil War, uh, but he was tasked to kind of go and survey the Western United States in the late 1800s. And he was looking at a few different things, but he was really looking at rainfall. He was looking at basically um, what areas were, were acceptable for farming. Where was there enough moisture that you could actually cultivate crops? Okay. And one of the things he ended up coming up with was well, this was his his, his, uh, his map that he was trying to show for um, how to shape the states in the Western United States. Okay. And this is basically based on watershed areas. Okay. So basically now you basically have these boxy states, watershed areas kind of cross those paths there. This is kind of looking at basically saying, if you want to keep the watershed, you know, waterfalls in a certain area, it's going to flow to a certain other part. So basically kind of keeping the water in certain areas. He understood, you know, 150 years ago that water was an important thing to the Western United States. But what this kind of comes to the path and kind of look uh, back at this is it kind of says this red line here sort of uh, ties in with, with John Wesley Powell's um, point there. When you're west of that, which is roughly the 100th meridian, you have less than 20 inches of rain annually. If you're east of that, you have more. And you can kind of see that basically when we kind of get west of this 100th meridian, you're starting to see these numbers jump up pretty high. It's very dry. Okay? That does affect crops. It also affects your pavements. It affects your skin. It affects a lot of things, right? Okay, so it's just kind of interesting kind of looking back, um, you know, that people observe some of these things and they have a lot of impact on what we do with pavements. So when we took a look, took a look at this model um, that we developed and tried to compare it to the MEPG model, we started looking at uh, sort of a frequency distribution here looking at all the curling and warping factors that are happening. And this I'm going to show you just for Las Vegas. Again, very dry climate. I know it's very difficult. There's a lot of, a lot of business kind of going on here. But with the existing MEPG model, we look at moisture warping. They're basically saying there's zero moisture warping based on their current model in Las Vegas. I'd have a hard time believing that. Okay. They recommend having a negative 10 built-in curl from that. So this is sort of this green portion here. The light blue portion is basically how the temperature differential is changing over a 20-year period. So you can see sometimes we have a positive temperature differential causing curled down. Sometimes we have a curled up situation. We have a negative temperature differential. This is kind of just looking at sort of how it's changing over time. Okay. The purple one is basically the addition of all three of those. Okay. So sort of the total equivalent temperature difference that's sort of happening and how it's sort of changing. And what I want you to focus on is sort of what percentage of the time we're in the positive in terms of the purple versus the negative. You can say the majority of the time here we're in the negative portion here in Las Vegas, but still quite a bit of time we have sort of this purple cases where we're actually above zero. I mean, we have a curled down slab, which is pretty hard to have in a place like Las Vegas. So if we look at our proposed model, our, our changes here, looking at sort of the built-in curl, um, the differential drying shakers here being about negative 15 for our case here, uh, moisture warping here being um, a negative eight, uh, looking at the, the same temperature differentials, is basically gonna sort of shift this down. We're only looking at a very few amount of times where the purple the total temperature, total moisture curl is going to give us above zero in a case like Las Vegas, okay? Which is probably a bit closer, closer to reality um, for, for those really dry cases here. In fact, if we kind of look at this and sort of look at it from the MPG standpoint here, with the MPG model, we had upward slabs about 74% of the time. With our model, it jumped up to 91% of the time. Um, of course, the magnitude of those also jumped up quite a bit. Uh, from a design standpoint, the differences between those two models, if you plug those into the MEPDG and you run the MEPDG and try to find out, keep above a, keep below a minimum level of cracking, 90% reliability. With the current MEPDG model, it said you need 10 inches. Okay. With the changes that we propose in our model, that same slab, same traffic, you need 12 and a half inches to withstand that cracking. Okay. That's a pretty big difference. That's a pretty big difference. Now, this being said, that's a pretty extreme case we're looking at here too. Okay. So. And we looked at a bunch of different areas here. So like areas, for instance, like Seattle, which is a little more wet, you're not going to see as much differential drying shrinkage. You're not going to expect that much. The, actually, the, the current MEPG model and our, our changes to our model gave pretty much the same answer in cases like that. But again, it's very site dependent, extremely site dependent. OK. One last thing I want to kind of show here um, is sort of how this ties into design. Uh, when I was at University of Illinois here, one of our products that we sort of developed here was a program called Radical. Um, this is a program we developed for the, the, uh, uh, the state of California, which is sort of a, I'll call it a MEPDG light. Okay. It looked at fatigue cracking in transverse direction, longitudinal direction, and corner cracking for concrete pavements, so joint plane concrete pavements. Okay. Why, what, what, what kind of cracking does the MEPDG predict in fatigue now? Does it predict longitudinal cracking, transverse cracking? Transverse. Top down, bottom up transverse cracking. Okay. 
one of the things, particularly if you start going out west, Washington State has a lot of this, California has a lot of this, they have a lot of corner cracking. They have a lot of longitudinal cracking. Okay? When you go to the Midwest, you see much less of that. You don't see nearly as much as of, of, of uh, longitudinal cracking, unless you have a widened slab. If you ever drive through Wisconsin, they have a lot of widened slabs. Every single one of those has longitudinal cracking. Why don't you want longitudinal cracking? If you could choose which, which failure mechanism you could have for a concrete pavement, transverse or longitudinal, which one would you choose? Why would you choose that? What's the problem with longitudinal cracking? There's a couple of problems with it. One is that basically when the crack happens, it tends to propagate through the slabs. So it can kind of propagate you know, miles down in the same direction potentially. Okay. Does anybody ride a motorcycle? No, no, no. If you ride a motorcycle, do you want transverse cracks or do you have longitudinal cracks? You want transverse. You'd rather have a bump than basically trying to ride that crack all the way down here. Particularly if you start getting a lot of built-in curl, a lot of the difference of drawing strings where the slab is curling up and it cracks and starts to settle, you start to get a faulting there, it, it's dangerous. It's very expensive to fix. You have to basically go through uh, tying these slabs together. Uh, not easy to do. So again, we start looking at pore curing. We kind of found that we found a lot of irreversible drawing shrinkage. That's that built-in curl. That's a differential drawing shrinkage. That's stuff that's not coming back. Okay. And why that matters is basically, uh, I'll we'll kind of show you through this program called Radical. Again, um, I call it MPG Light. It's just focusing on, on fatigue cracking um, of joint plane concrete pavements. Doesn't look at IRI, doesn't look at faulting, these kind of things. But um, we can basically predict cracking in multiple different locations. So what I have here is a 15-foot uh, a slab. So we have some low, low transverse slabs here, uh, which is the case in California a lot. And in this case here, if we have no built-in curling, or what we call EBITD, equivalent built-in temperature difference. This was Professor Razor and uh, uh, Dr. Sri Rao put together this, this, uh, this term years ago. If we have no built-in curling, basically the traffic is going in this direction here. Okay. We're going to see our primary focus of where we're going to see our cracking is going to happen. It's going to start at the bottom. This is right about midway um, between the slabs here. That's exactly what Westergaard told you with your edge, edge slabs. It's going to start at the bottom. It's going to be between the slabs, right at the edge. Okay. With no built-in curl, that's probably still right. Okay. If we start increasing the built-in curl to negative 10, this is the default measure uh, in the uh, MEPDG, um, you can see it starts to widen out a little bit. We go to negative 20, you know, it starts to widen a little bit more. We start to see a little bit of uh, something happening here at the transverse joints here. When we get to negative 30, though, the primary mechanism for fatigue failure goes from being bottom-up uh, cracking at the um, longitudinal edges can promote a transverse crack to now top-down cracking roughly in the wheel path. This can cause longitudinal cracking. Okay. Take it to negative 40. Now it's going to be top-down cracking. Negative 50, about the same here. Okay. So again, based on how much how much differential drawing strength you have, how much built-in curling you're going to have, you may actually change your your fatigue failure mechanism. Can completely change. Okay. Now, if we do the same thing, we look at short slabs. Okay, this is a 12 foot slab, 3.7 mil, uh, meter slab. Again, no built in curl. Westergaard's still right here. Take a negative 10, we're about the same. Negative 20 there. Negative 30, same funky things start to happen. Now we're starting to get here longitudinal cracking happening, being the predominant mechanism. But now we start looking at really high built in curls, the negative 40, negative 50s. What this is saying is basically you're going to get longitudinal cracking if you don't address this in some way. Okay, that, that becomes the predominant fatigue tra transfer function or fatigue uh, failure function is going to be top-down uh, uh, longitudinal cracking. So that becomes a problem. So a couple conclusions here, just to kind of wrap things up. Um, again, I, I don't want to belittle the MEPDG. I, I think when I still look at the MEPDG, there's so many great things that are resulting from this. The push from, again, going from the ASHTO method to where we're at with MEPDG is just light years ahead. But the fact is it's only a few steps ahead. There's still a lot of puzzle pieces that need to be put together to just really start to really understand what's happening in pavements, how pavements are failing here. You know, in the past, we're basically not doing site-specific design. Well, now we're starting to look at that. We're looking at temperature. Okay? We have the ability to look at moisture. This thing. These things are really important. Okay? And the MPD does start to account for this. Okay? Not, not as well as it could be done. But again, I think that's sort of where we're all, that's why we're still here. That's why we're employed, uh, is that there's a lot of work to be done in pavement still. And that's something sort of a, a big step forward, but it's not basically solving this here. Um, one key thing I want to take away from this is that the amount of reversible uh, shrinkage can be controlled to some degree based on curing. Okay. 
if you do a poor job curing, you should expect that a lot of that shrinkage is going to be permanent. You know, what the mechanism behind that is, that's debatable. Those are things that we, we'd like to kind of focus on in the future here. But we can basically control that by the curing here at the macro level, curing conditions, water scent ratio, controlling those capillary pores, how much the volume of those pores are going to be, how much shrinkage you're going to get from that. That's something that we can kind of create here at, at the human scale, things that we can do ourselves here. Again, at the nano scale here, you know, again, it's going to affect things like gel spacing from the CSH gel, micro cracking. But this needs a lot of further investigation. This is sort of just, again, this is a side project we end up doing. Uh, I thought there's some interesting findings here. Um, but the key thing to kind of take away from this too is that we start, we're starting to get some tools that we can start addressing things like reversible shrinkage, drying shrinkage, built-in curling, uh, temperature curling. We can start to address these things now in design. And that's something that's, uh, that's pretty new. So things to be excited about kind of going in the future. So with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Yeah. Yes, up here front. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What? Well, yeah. I, I think so. So, from a logical perspective, again, we're all engineers here, so I think logic tends to, to work pretty well with us. That seems like a logical next step, right? Is to start to, to address this. This is a test that, to my knowledge, states don't have you know a limit to this that they put. Uh, you know how much drying shrinkage is acceptable. Um, this is something that we start looking at. You know, I've always been very jealous of the asphalt industry. Okay, uh, super pave isn't perfect, but it's a fact that they actually went through and they look at some fundamental material properties trying to characterize asphalt binders and how it affects pavement performance. And that's why I really think concrete is, is, is kind of lacking behind, is that we, you know, we, step, we do a slump test. Okay? We do a 28-day you know, compressive strength test. I mean, we're not even failing compression. Okay? But you know, start looking at it from a little bit more, not this is, this is an advanced materials. This is basically pretty standard stuff. Pretty standard tests have been developed for years. But we still don't do it. We still don't put these in standards. And that's something that I would sort of say is a sort of next step, is to start putting some of these things in place to understand that these are things that have a huge impact in terms of when your payment's going to fail and how it's going to fail. Yet we completely just ignore it. And you know, we focus on strength only. It's, you know, high strength is the best. Uh, I was talking to um, one of my former students who was working in uh, Wisconsin DOT, and they want to use uh, ultra high performance concrete, UHPC, in, in, in concrete payments. And my first question was, why? Well, well high strength is better. It's like, well, to some degree, yeah, but there's there's things that come with that. You know, there's more autonomous shrinkage that comes. With it. There's so many other factors that are going in that. And right now, again, we start to, we're starting to have the tools to handle this, right? The MPDG isn't perfect, but it starts to be able to handle some of these things. But yet, we're not taking advantage of it. Uh, one of the things I'm a, a huge advocate of is the understanding, basically, how materials, mechanics, and performance are all intertwined. In that, basically, you need to understand that materials could drive the pavement to be successful, could be could fail it completely. Uh, it's all intertwined. We tend to work in these little silos. You know, well, we're just, here's my strength, I'm going to do design, okay? Materials, well, that was done two years in advance. We're, we already have the design done, we can't change the materials. It's like, that doesn't make sense, right? They're all intertwined how the payments can perform, and we need to do a better job of that. So, excellent observation. Here. Well, uh, excellent presentation, Dave. Good to have you back. Oh, and appreciate it. Very interesting presentation. Uh, I, was, uh, I was curious, the. Uh, uh, the map and the typical shrinkage, well, the temperature, cool, and see sure. things, the differences you show, uh, the deficit surplus. We usually use the torn plate moisture index. I think it's commonly it's, it's similar. similar. It's, it's similar to that, yeah. Have, have you checked? Uh, we haven't how, checked it. We haven't checked it against that, but I bet you, you know, that's, that's it's probably a thing. Yeah, it, it's you know it's the same thing. If those of you are familiar with the torn plate moisture index, it's sort of looking at uh, evapotransportation and you know, basically surplus of moisture versus a deficit of moisture, but I would bet, I would guarantee, you know, we looked at, that was developed from the ambient relative community maps. So basically, I had, I think, 250 or 300 different sites looking at the, you know, the ambient relative community of those sites and kind of creating a map uh, from that. But I bet you it would probably coincide pretty well with that. Probably. Yeah. So. The other thing is, also in Minnesota, they have now 60-year <laughs> design labs. Yeah. 
that's always something that, um, I, you know, California one time was talking about 100-year designs, and you're like, you know, when I think about payments, I think we've got a, a better handle of predicting with things like fatigue crafting, things like faulting. But you start looking at, say, material distresses, ASR. We have no idea how to predict when ASR is going to happen. ASR is going to happen in every concrete in the world. But when is it going to start to manifest itself as actually cracking and it's going to be detrimental to your payment? I don't know. You know, how can you, is it going to happen for 60 years? Maybe. You know, but you're right. the Minnesota approach is basically saying, well, let's put our best materials, our best dowel bars, a little bit, you know, an inch extra thickness. That's our 60-year design. But there's really no guarantee of that. You are supposed to be flying cars in 50, 60 years, I think. So it should, shouldn't matter in, in the end here. I've been watching the Jetsons for years, so we're, we're, we're pretty close. They do have flying cars, though. Oh, do they? I've been holding up. We're like 25 years behind the grave. I don't know what's going on here. It's a patent on that, and it is a flying car. Snowmobile. That's that's where I'm at. That's right. There's actually a parking lot for snowmobiles up there. I kid you not. Uh, for all your drying shrinkage that was stored at 50 percent RH, did those yeah. receive any moist gearing before going in? Uh, one or day. One, one day. One day, basically just cheesecloth on top. Covered here. Yep. Okay. So, so it really wasn't uh, excessive. But basically, it's meant to be kind of like the, the minimum yeah. minimum curing possible before you demold it. Yes. Yeah, some of the pictures you show about the testing, um, you show some beams. And I was wondering if uh, is, is there any effect of actually testing size effect or shape effect? Like instead of it being an actual plane? Um, <laughs> there would be. There would be. Now, again, what we did is we used the ACM uh, C157, which is a standard test, okay, three inch diameter. Uh, Three by three inch specimens. If we do the same thing, one of the things that uh, I have an undergraduate student that's starting to do this is we we're trying to look at, you know, well, you can be never going to care for a year. What happens if you care for one day versus three days versus seven days versus say, 14 days? Is that enough? Okay. And we're doing this now, we're going to do with mortar specimens, one inch by one inch square specimens, about 11 inches long. That's going to be different though. You start thinking about the, the, the drying that's happening. The drying is happening on the outside. If you think about three by three inch block, that whole specimen isn't going through. Uh, drying shrinkage itself, just the outside of it, the core is. You start looking at one inch by one inch, the size effect from that. Now maybe, maybe now, now maybe the whole thing is going to go through drying shrinkage eventually, because uh, it's basically closer to the surface there. So I'm sure there is a, a huge size effect to this. That uh, you know, it's there's a lot of challenges we, we have, you know, from this and, and all the work that you guys are doing as well. There's always there's always challenges to kind of be uh, looking at and size effect being a, a big one. We do be able to scale from laboratory type size things to, you know. Civil engineering scale, which is just huge. So, but I'm sure there's, there's, a, there's a science back to this. Yeah, I have a question about the experiment and do the, um, the cycle for, for the drying and wetting. Drying and wetting. Like, well, for, about the procedure, what you're saying? Or? Yeah. yeah, so basically, it's, 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 this isn't rocket science. Okay? This, is, this is rocks and sand and cement, right? So, basically, you're going to create these specimens here. Um, we do build them after one day. Some of them we, we encompass with a aluminum tape to kind of seal in as much as we can of moisture to try to sort of isolate the autogen shrinkage. We're basically take that, we're going to put it into uh, a 50 percent relative humidity room. It's going to be exposed to all surfaces as long as it's not uh, with the aluminum tape foil. Um, it's just going to be sitting there in, in, a, in a controlled environment there. The same thing, we take some of those, we put it in a 100 percent relative humidity room, basically a fog cure. It's basically always, it's not sitting in water, but the ambient relative humidity is going to be 100 percent relative humidity. So again, those specimens actually swell up a bit because there's more moisture than they actually need. So um, we take them out. The first couple days, we'll test it every day. We'll measure the specimen because it's changing a lot those first few days. But then after, you know, maybe every first five days, we'll check it every day, then maybe every week. And then, you know, we start to get after a month. It's really not changing a lot. So you can test it every month or two. But it's a very simple test. You take it out, put it under LBT, spin it to, to the measurement. And basically, from that, you calculate what the strain is going to be. You know what the original the shape, uh, shape was. You know the change in, in the uh, uh, that dimension. It's a pretty simple, pretty simple test. So. You just take it out, you test them, and you put it back into. The and then you put it right back in. Yeah. Unless we basically ascertained, when we started flipping them back and forth. We kind of said if we started getting three or four days in a row with the same reading, we kind of said that sort of leveled out. Then maybe we might take it from being in a wet cure, put it back in a dry cure, kind of flip it around again. Uh -oh. So, but we want to make sure it's sort of stabilized first. That usually takes about a month or so. so. Much easier to stabilize when it's getting wet versus drying. The drying takes a long time. 
the wetting, you know, it's, you hop in the shower, you get wet pretty quick. Uh, to dry off, it takes a little while, right? So, same thing with the concrete. But adding up to one day is just a drying shrinkage, a tarnish shrinkage. Yeah, the tarnish shrinkage, you know, for about a month. You know, once you after about a month or so, your tarnish shrinkage is pretty pretty stable. It's not going to change at that point. So, but it takes about a month or so. Maybe you know, ballpark could be 60 days, could be 20 days, but somewhere in that range. Typically, it's going to be very stable. But the drying shrinkage is what's changing all the time. Good question. Thank you, uh, Professor Hiller, for this talk. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time.